I just want to take a second to thank all of these people for this book because I love Strixhaven. It's so creative and interesting and complex and also lets me live out my fantasy of attending a magic school. But within the motions of making this video, I am going to respond to some of the critiques that have been made towards Strixhaven. This isn't like a response drama video. This is just a video about me talking about why I love this book so much. And yeah, you guys don't have to agree with me. You rarely ever do. <laughs> and maybe I'm looking past some of its flaws because I love it so much. But I at least wanted to take this opportunity to throw my shield up in defense of this book because I think there's so much that it did right, especially in comparison to other books that we've gotten in the past. I'm looking at you, Storm King's Thunder. One of the major criticisms I've seen about Curriculum of Chaos is that the adventure inside of the book is too bare bones. And I can totally see this point. I love having overly detailed adventure modules. If the adventure has a town, I want to know everything about the town, every NPC that lives in it, every quest the players can get inside of it. If there's a tavern, how much does it cost to stay there? What rumors can the players find inside this tavern in this town in this specific adventure module? It's great because as a DM, I can just sit there and let the book do all the work. Except for when you're not entirely sure which table an NPC is supposed to be sitting at. So you decide, ah, this one's fine, it doesn't really matter. And then you look back in the book and it turns out that a secret hatch the characters are looking for is below that table and the characters are inquiring on where it is. And a group of baddies at the other table are secretly hiding it. And, and now you've switched the tables so it makes no sense. No worries, just put the secret hatch on the other table. Now everything will be fine. But now the dungeon underneath the table is compromised. Since the tavern has an overhang, it's impossible for the hatch to be there. So it has to be on the other table and, well, We'll just say it's a magic trap door. Yeah, but then the wizard could just find it with detect magic and- Hey guys, uh, the NPCs are actually sitting at the other table. Yeah, my mistake. Oh, cause the trap door is under that one, huh? Ah! Okay, my point with that is that sometimes it's a little annoying to have an adventure module be overly detailed. And I think it's important to remember that we're playing a make-believe game where we're making it up as we go. So having every nook and cranny be detailed and written out can leave a lot of room for error on the DM's part. I'm not gonna argue that Strixhaven isn't a skeleton, because it kind of is, but I don't see a skeleton. I see a very spacious house with a lot of rooms for my friends to decorate in. When we ran a little bit of Strixhaven over on Arcane Arcade, it was so fun because my players got to take control of the narrative here and there. You know, it's you're running... running to center campus as you're all the way on the other side of Witherbloom, yep. yeah. as you oh are going God. towards the bridge, <laughs> and you're running over and you see this last carriage. And as they begin to take off, you have just enough time to run forward, jump, and land on the carriage. He jumps, um, and some, and there's a, a buzzing as bees carry him. Yes, the last just. <laughs> 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 Great, I've made it. To me, the adventure isn't bare bones. It just has a lot of comfortable room for storytelling. Instead of, we need to know every detail, and if we mess one up, then the entire story may derail. We got to relax and play sort of a moldable clay of an adventure. For example, in this book, it does not detail where the dorms are. Do we need to know where the dorms are? Or can you just say, you go to your dorms, and give the opportunity to the players and even the DM to narrate what the dorms look like and how they operate. Do we need to have a hex-gridded map or description of every building in center campus, or can we come up with it and fill in those fun details? Once that happens, something really personal happens to Strixhaven. It becomes your Strixhaven. And our Strixhaven may be different than your Strixhaven. And yes, I already know that the argument is that it's annoying that we have to come up with all this stuff for Strixhaven. We have to fill in those gaps and do extra work as a dungeon master for this pre-written module. I personally don't think that's true. I think this skeleton has a very strong spine and is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I think that this book gives a really solid base 
in order for you to creatively come up with what's in the middle. Instead of creating an enormous list where every single class takes place and what time they take place and when you have to go to them and sticking to that schedule every single day, they just give a list of classes per year that characters can take. And when we did this, we kind of just decided like when they were. And yes, it did get a little weird when somebody was like, what time is this class? And for the most part, I just kind of came up with a number and then we wrote that down and continued on with the adventure. Spencer's character was actually completely overwhelmed with the amount of things that they were doing. She really wanted to play a character who was trying to balance extracurriculars, a job and their school life. So they were taking all of these classes. But I don't know if that would have necessarily been possible had it all been prearranged. The point I'm trying to make is that Strixhaven isn't trying to be this overly detailed adventure. It's a slice of life, creative storytelling, role-playing game using the foundations of D&D. And that's kind of what we're doing at the table anyways. We're here to engage in cooperative storytelling and roll dice to determine outcomes. I don't like sitting down at a D&D table where the DM has to explain 400 different things in context that I now have to understand. And if I want to add something into that, they go, no, actually there's a thing for that anyways, it's over here. It feels like I'm playing a video game with cutscenes and quick time events, and I just wanna skip them in order to get to the fun part of the video game where I get to make decisions. You know, I think Strixhaven would probably suck to play on Roll20. We played D&D Online for the most part of 2020, and when we went back to playing in person, it felt like we went from playing D&D the RTS to D&D the cooperative storytelling role-playing game. Because role-playing over the internet is so hard to do sometimes. But it's really easy with tools like Roll20, Fantasy Grounds, Foundry, whatever you use, to have tokens and maps and enemies and health bars, having art that you can throw up on the screen, having NPCs be at your fingertips with just the click of a button, being able to speak as other NPCs, having on-screen effects, animated spells, going through a dungeon and turning the corner and seeing what's down the dungeon. It sort of feels like a video game. And that's really fun. I really enjoyed running Tomb of Annihilation in this way. And hey, if that's your fun, then great. That's awesome. I enjoyed it too. But this is also my fun. And we can't call it bad just because it doesn't fulfill every desire of one select group. Strixhaven really opens up the narrative door whenever you decide to create a character or even make a game. You're given the five different colleges, which by the way, are really, really cool. You've got Silver Quill, they're the poets, the theater kids, the linguistics majors, the writers. You've got Prismari, they're creative arts. They use magic to create physical things. They're also theater kids, but in more of like a way. You've got Quandrix, the biomathematicians. They use formulas and math to use magic. You've got Witherbloom. All of the druids or other natural studies are done here. They learn about life and death, decay and growth. And also their campus is in a swamp, which is awesome. And then you've got Lorehold. Their campus is a big hole in the ground and they delve down there to find ancient histories. They study old magic, they study history, they study forgotten relics, artifacts, and they have like a big old library of stuff. And the reason why I like the way they structured this book and this sort of skeleton is, hey, where exactly is Lorehold's library? That's not something that you have to know. Instead, your character can just go to the Lorehold library and the DM and the player can have this role play back and forth about what they do in the library. In Strixhaven, gives you a bunch of options on what to put in there. One of my favorite creatures in the book is this thing called a Cogwork Archivist. It's this construct that gets books for you. They don't detail how exactly this thing works, so I just described that it moves around on its wheels and it can like extend from its body in order to grab books. That wasn't like a ton of prep I had to do in order to make this game like everybody's describing. Which is a major gripe I keep hearing people say is that, oh, I basically have to write the book for them. I didn't write that. That's something we just came up with in the moment. Just a fun way for us to narrate how the cogwork archivists work. And what's fun is that we're not beholden to the rules that are set inside of the book. Instead, it becomes our own. And the reason I think this is important is because I think this is a really fun way to play D&D. And I would love to see more books like this. 
Why is everybody dislike skill challenges? Okay, I know that this video is supposed to be me talking about why I like Strixhaven so much, and I'm getting there, and I wanna talk about why I like skill challenges so much, but first we gotta address why everybody else doesn't like them. Skill challenges are not, hey everybody, let's just roll some dice and see if we all succeed. Oh, we did great, good job. Okay, move on to the next segment. You get to let players describe badass character moves Without the whole, do you have the movement speed to run there? Okay, you need to have an athletics check, okay? And then uh, you it's your action to cast Mage Hand, so you're gonna have to do that on your next turn, and then on your next turn, you can make an acrobatics check in order. Shh, shh, shh. I wanna do a backflip off my tensor floating disc to score a point in Mage Tower. Or I'm running with the mascot, and I wanna misty step and juke to go this way. And then I wanna cast Disguise Self in order to look like one of the other teammates to confuse them. In case you don't know what a skill challenge is, basically it's a point in D&D when the entire group is doing a similar thing. And instead of rolling initiative and having everybody do all of their actions in a very specific order over and over and over again, instead you do a skill challenge where everybody decides what skill they want to make in order to try to escape a river of sand, sail a ship through a storm, or play Mage Tower, which is the sport in Strixhaven, and it's awesome. And then there's a DC, and so everybody has to roll with their associated skill, and depending on how many succeed, determines the outcome. So there's typically like a total fail, a half success, and then like a total success, and you get different outcomes based on which one you get. The rules of the game are that you've got two teams and you got a big old tower and you have a little mascot and you take the little mascot who's a living thing and you have to get it up the tower and into the hoop and it's uh, better than Quidditch. And the reason why I like skill challenges so much is because there's no limit to what you can do. You just pick one of those skills. Uh, animal handling, sounds good. Gonna roll that. How do you use animal handling to steer a boat? So I'm a druid, I'm gonna talk to a whale, and the whale is going to help us steer us back to shore. Cool, that's what happens in the game. That is awesome. Because you're literally giving narrative control to your players to make decisions outside of the rules so they can describe what their character does. And guys, it's so fun. <laughs> so when I ran Strixhaven, I kind of did my own thing. I want to run the pre-written in the future, so instead I took bits of the pre-writtens and put them into our one shot for like a mix and mash of everything else. So I took the Mage Tower rules, but we didn't do Mage Tower, instead we did Silk Ball, which is another one of the sports in the game. My version of Silk Ball is that it's like soccer, but it's like 3D soccer where there's goals on all the sides, and then there's pillars in the middle that the ball can stick to. But your Silk Ball could be something completely different. It could just be soccer, and that's fine. I like that I got to come up with my Silk Ball. But regardless, we use the skill challenge rules with the game, and it was so fun because everyone got to be useful. One of the best parts they added to skill challenges in Strixhaven is that you can cast a first or second level spell to get advantage on your skill challenge roll, or you can cast a third level spell to just succeed. And when you're going to mage school and you're learning spells, it's really cool to use magic in order to win at 3D soccer. Javanesh, I want to square up on him and cast heat metal on his cool little thing. Oh my god! <laughs> Could I be watching for another player to be casting a spell and cast counter spell? That's cool. Yes, okay. yes. Mel with Thorn had caused uh, like these roots to sort of come out of the ground and grab at your guys' legs and you counter spell and they go back into the ground and he says, damn it. What's the like smallest person? The smallest person? On the other team. Uh, there is another halfling on their team. Oh. Can I use? Ooh, 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 ooh. Um, I see where you're going. Can I use reduce? <laughs> <laughs> and then start making a head run towards you, and then they <laughs> just shrink down, <laughs> and they can barely run across the field as they're running along. Just um, just close line them. Yeah. Stop or um, step on them. One of the coolest parts too was we were realizing how useful certain spells would be. We were just naming off how you could use different spells in scenarios, like Skyrite. Could you imagine using Skyrite? in silk ball in order to succeed. You're just writing in the sky that everybody is a big stinky loser. And then if you succeed, the other team's like, oh, and you like score a point. <laughs> if you're running skill challenges, it's just, all right, everybody roll a dice and everybody just rolls a dice and you count up how many of you succeed and you just read the outcome, then um, you severely misunderstood the assignment. 
Skill challenges are just the perfect opportunity for the players to describe how they get to play their character and how they appear in the game. Whether it's helping out a teammate, playing Silk Ball, or just of being their character. And look, I'm not saying that skill challenges take over everything in D&D. I still really like combat. I think that that sort of rigid rule set works really well. But for things that aren't as rigid as that, for, like chases, the chase mechanic is dumb and it doesn't make sense. Or sports. Like, it would be so boring to play Mage Tower and like set up a grid and then keep track of every single player and then all of the other players. It would take forever. Our Silk Ball game was so quick, we did it in one game. It was a good time. One of my favorite parts about Strixhaven is that written into the text of the book is time made for characters to roleplay. I love this trend and I would love to see it more in future books. Other adventure modules give you little guides on how to roleplay characters and I do appreciate those. In Strixhaven, the adventure module has the balls to say, hey, roleplay here a little bit. And while this is not something that I as a dungeon master necessarily need, I have known a lot of dungeon masters who don't do this. The book tells them to have the NPC give them the information and to move on because, oh, oh, we have a story to tell and we gotta get along with the story thing. But Strixhaven lets you take your time and it really lends itself to this idea of being a slice of life magic school game. You don't need to know what's happening at every single hour in this campaign. If you're still struggling to kind of see my side of this, think of it like a TV show where there's cuts and characters are then doing something in the next cut. Or players get from point A to point B, but it's not necessarily important how they got from point A to point B since we're just on a campus. And I know I've said this like a million times in this video already, but this allows room for the players to come up with this narrative as well. When we started all of our games, I had everyone describe why they were late to class and the narrative control was just in their hands because there was nothing they had to live up to. There was like three things. They had to be at class, there's a campus they're on, and they know that there's a carriage that'll take them to the next class. And he's just sitting there. Next to him is a, a stack of books and a coffee on top. And someone runs by and he... <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and as they like start booking it towards the carriages again, to yeah. the center, they, um, their clothes change from th this costume yeah. as they drop this guy's self. They're no longer a tiefling either. They they look more like just a half elf with like red. Yeah, you're red literally hair. like mid running and mid changing, mm -hmm. and oh, as you dope. transform yeah. over. Uh, very focused. Uh, she's got a book in one hand, and she's. If you hear her closely, she's just kind of going down her list of notes. Okay, so this is the the uh, formula for this one. This is the formula for this one. I would say that Callisto uh, passes by a small owlin. Yeah. sitting at a dragon chess board <laughs> and um, he just kind of looks and makes a move and the mm -hmm. fractal tilts its head that was a damn good example of the gold dragon's gambit uh, <laughs> and all of them came up with really unique and creative ways on how they did this and it showcased their characters and i feel like that's something you won't often get in these overly detailed pre-written modules one of the other best parts too is that there are other npcs who will give you like benefits if you befriend them and if you piss them off you get negatives they're not just a bunch of normal people who have goals and ideals and agendas they're all so unique and they have their own personalities and backstories. It's so creative and unique to this book and I really want NPCs like this in future games. I love that if you piss off Quintilius Antiphian Melentor III, he and his homies show up to your performances and boo you specifically. <laughs> What Strixhaven also really nails is being relatable. Almost everyone has a school or college related experience and it's fun to bring that into D&D. And that's the other thing about Strixhaven, it's so unique. We haven't gotten anything like this in Dungeons and Dragons for a long time. The main story of the pre-written adventure inside the book is you're trying to stop this evil frog wizard named Mergaxor. He's causing all sorts of trouble at Strixhaven, which I'm not going to spoil. And the players uncover what he's doing in mysteries and in segments of the adventure. It's sort of this underlying plot. But all the while, they're trying to balance their education and you get into really fun situations like, oh no, I ran out of spell slots while fighting an evil alien that's trying to take over our school because I used all of my spell slots in the playoffs for Silk Ball or I was too busy foiling a secret Uruk plot that 
I had to pull an all-nighter in order to pass my Scrivening and Symbology exam. <laughs> Why is it when something happens, it is always you three? Oh yeah, there's exams. And the exam mechanic is so fun. So in the pre rain adventure, you don't take exams for every single class you take part in. That would get really annoying. Imagine we're sitting at the table and all four players have eight classes and they have to attend every class because the players aren't going to take all the same classes together. And it would be like an eight hour game of everybody studying for every individual final, which is ridiculous. Instead, the pre-written adventure, in my opinion, makes the really smart decision to just put all of the players into a general ed class that they all take per semester. And this class is where you get to highlight some of the exams that the players take. Once again, think of it like slice of life. We're not looking at every single final that everybody's doing, we're just looking at this little one that they're doing for a scene that takes place during our game. Basically, the way exams work is that you have two roles that you're going to make while taking the exam in order to try to pass. It's basically a skill challenge. The two different roles highlight what the players are actually doing during the exam. It doesn't just say roll two dice, it gives an example as to what the players are actually doing during this exam. If they succeed both checks, they ace the exam. If they only succeed one, one, they pass, and if they fail both, they get an F. And if you succeed the exams, you actually get a bonus in-game. In Strixhaven, there are these things called student dice. It's a D4 that you can add to an ability check, and you get them once per long rest. You typically get them with whatever extracurricular you pick, so if you're in band, you get a D4 to performance checks. But for exams, it just depends on what you took the exam on, which can be really helpful in certain situations. It's also like a ludonarrative way to want to pass exams. You'll get a cool bonus to your character, but you also have to study for your exams. And if you study, you get one reroll on any of the dice that you roll during the exam. And studying is a whole other section that you have to do. If you study, you make rolls, and if you succeed those rolls, you get a re-roll during the exam. You can also do group studying. If you do group studying, you get advantage on your role to study. Which was fun because in our game, uh, Jordan's character Honeybee, who's a gnome spores druid who reflavored his spores as bees, <laughs> was using his bees in order to help everyone study. So like they were turning pages and stuff, and it, it was great. <laughs> But what you can also do is pull an all-nighter, which is just so great. I love that so much. That is just so relatable and fun. And uh. if you pull an all-nighter, you get to roll two checks. And if you succeed them both, you get two re-rolls. So you get an extra re-roll at the cost of having a level of exhaustion the next day. Yeah, and I know a first level of exhaustion gives you disadvantage on your ability checks, which would kind of defeat the purpose of pulling the all-nighter in the first place, but I had it be a constitution saving throw, and I also said you could get rid of it if you drank coffee the next day, like at the Fireholt Cafe. And after we did this entire section, the exam became like a really tense part of our game. Everybody really wanted to succeed it. It wasn't important just to get the student dice, but like for their characters, it was important to them that they passed these exams and these finals for the game and what I actually did is I took the exams that they were doing and they were on Scrivening and Symbology. They were learning about symbol in one and later in the adventure I actually put a symbol in the game that they had to find a way to diffuse and they took what they learned from their exam and applied it to that situation. Kind of like a Snape telling everybody to learn about werewolves in Prisoner of Azkaban situation. Oh, you can also cheat on exams, and if you succeed the cheating checks, you ace the test, but if you fail, you fail the exam, and the book kind of says that you can dish out a punishment to this player, and I think that's so fun, because instead of being like, you have to spend 1d4 days uh, in detention or something, it, just coming up with a way that you do this, you can have a personal punishment that the teacher gives to the player, like maybe they can't compete in their next silk ball game, or maybe they have to spend time in the Sedgemoor looking for brackish trudges, or maybe they have to skip out on an audition for a play. Like, the possibilities are endless. A minor point I want to touch on too is that a lot of people are upset that there's not a lot of downtime activities in Strixhaven, and personally, I don't think you need them because the entire game is downtime. There shouldn't be these gaps in time where the players are just doing nothing. The way I sort of ran it is that every night the players went back to their dorms and did something unique to their character. We had NPCs that talked back and forth. We had players who prepared certain things. Maybe they studied for an exam. Maybe they practiced certain spells. It's not the 
type of game where you need to go have a shopping episode, really. And that's kind of like what school is. School isn't like one main quest. It's like you are a person who's getting a bunch of side quests and you're trying to manage all of the side quests without dying from exhaustion and stress. And Strixhaven does that perfectly. Strixhaven really reignited something for me. I've been enjoying running Rime of the Frostmaiden, but I kind of owe it to my players for making it really goofy and fun. But I think another reason why games like Curse of Strahd are so coveted is because the story is kind of bare bones. There's a lot of mystery. A lot of things are long gone and dead. And it makes room for players and DMs to sort of fill in those gaps. I know for a fact that my Curse of Strahd was way different than somebody else's Curse of Strahd. It's also why I like Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Dragon Heist allows you to play it multiple different ways, so even if you decide to play it with a different group, you could change up the villain if you wanted to. But you also get to decide which villain that you want so that it's sort of your adventure. And they don't go into insane amounts of details to explain the entire plan of Jarlaxle. They give him little points on where he goes, but you could add in more details to make Jarlaxle even cooler. Both Waterdeep and Curse of Strahd have like these little mysteries that aren't detailed. They aren't packed to the brim with information that you need to know in order to run this game. Instead, the adventure does a lot of the heavy lifting so the DM and the players can make these fun sort of bridges. And that's why I dislike Storm King's Thunder so much because it's the exact opposite. It's all flesh and no skeleton. <laughs> It takes all the possible locations and things you can do and fills them out in detail and then says, figure out which way you're gonna go next. You better get the lore right, dumbass. And yeah, maybe this is just a me and my friends sort of situation. Maybe you and your friends like to play D&D completely different. Storm King's Thunder is like the best campaign you've ever played in. I know you exist out there and that's fine. You're allowed to have that fun. But we had a hell of a time playing Strixhaven and I don't think that that was just us. I think that this book provided a lot of the source and fun of that. And mostly because I like how this book presents itself. It's not this over the top, you need to know everything, big old detailed kind of game. It's relaxed and it has a focus on role play and narrative. And I really want to see more of that. And in my opinion, some of the best D&D adventure modules are sort of framed like this. They're isolated. You don't need to know all of the lore and every detail in order to play the game. Tomb of Annihilation, Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frostmaiden, Curse of Strahd. Those adventures don't take place smack dab in the middle of the Forgotten Realms. They take you to an isolated corner and cut you off so you exist in this space. Some of the best D&D adventures I've played are of this make, where we're stepping back, we're not taking in every detail, and we're filling in some of the details on our own, with our characters' backstories, with our own version of this narrative. Creating stories and memories and rolling dice and hitting monsters and slinging spells. I just want to recognize that this book brought me and my friends a lot of joy, and I would hope to see more of it in the future. Okay, that is the video there. I am going to go edit this video because <laughs> it's I'm recording it. This is the recording and now I'm going to go edit. So that's what I'm going to do. I, it's a loop. It's a loop again. It all goes back to it all. It all turns around, goes back to the circle, the circle of making YouTube videos. What am I doing? <laughs>